Hi everyone, good morning, and I'm painting live this morning from my little garden here, and a lot of you requested a watercolor peony demonstration, so that is what I'm going to do. So I'm gonna flip the camera around and show you my simple plein air watercolor uh, system. So I'll just flip it around here. So what I've got is, um, this is a St. Petersburg Yarka watercolor set, and it is unbelievably pigmented. Uh, super rich, semi-moist, which means like slightly tacky, uh, pre-filled pans. This is the ultra set, so it's um, quite extensive. There are a lot of seemingly dark colors in here, but um, once they're wet, you can actually see like we've got a really dark hooker's green here uh, we do have some blacks but I generally like to make my own blacks um, throughout this session this morning I'll be making a lot of just like custom colors so again this is the st. Petersburg uh, it used to be called the Yarka set but uh, I'm sure you can find it on their website. So I've got this and if I need um, this little tray just flips like this and then the cover can be used as well for uh, a palette space and then if I need anything uh, in addition to that I just have like a little a plastic palette here so um, I've got that propped up on just a little travel stool and then I'm going to be sitting on this tripod stool here. I've got a selection of brushes. This is way more than I need, but I just brought everything out uh, that I generally have in this bag. Now this is a very luxurious setup because I'm at home so I can just grab whatever I need. But uh, generally speaking, I do work on this travel stool. And then this little one is super easy to carry around with me. So, um, and it's really, it's short, uh, but it's enough to raise it up so that when I'm sitting and painting in watercolor, um, I can just reach down and everything is super accessible. So I've got a spray bottle, which I used. I've already spritzed my paints to get them primed and ready to go. Um, and my brush kit here, I like using a stiff travel case for my brushes so that they um, don't get damaged in transit especially oftentimes when I'm doing travel workshops abroad we move quite often from place to place and I do bring my quality brushes like I bring all my sable brushes with me that's what I like to paint with and um, the, the stiffer case just protects them during travel so that um, things don't get broken I've got um, a number of pencils here. I'll probably just be sketching with my barrel turquoise pencil. Uh, it's a mechanical pencil. And this will just be a quick, light, easy breezy watercolor of these little peonies. And I may very well um, put in the uh, little Buddha statue who is adorable. And this actually, this scene looks into my studio space, which you can't really see right now, but this is my studio space in there. <laughs> so it's kind of nice uh, this morning to be outside. It's perfect temperature. Usually it's uh, like this last week has been super muggy, so I'm very pleased. Uh, so in addition to my selection of brushes here, I've got um, a water bottle and this is what I travel with. I actually travel just with stacked um, Tupperware. So I've got two Tupperwares here. Today, I'm not working in a really broad range of color, so I think just the two pools will be enough. But this, um, this Tupperware container has two little spaces. It's super lightweight, so that's a really good tip for you if you're looking for travel water containers. Um, I've used collapsible bowls before, but I find these are just, the base is really sturdy, and sometimes the collapsible silicone bowls, like pet dishes, <laughs> when I brought those, um, the plein air experience is very unpredictable and the turf can be and the terrain can be very irregular and uh, the bottoms of those silicone bowls are just a little soft so if you're placing it on a rock or a stump or uneven ground um, I find the Tupperware works better. Thank you everybody for joining it's really nice to see you. Um, so what I'm going to be doing is 
painting, I've uh, chosen to work with my Fabriano paper here. So I've got a Fabriano block and uh, what that means is, I'll just show you, it's a pad of paper essentially. So it's a pad of paper, but instead of loose sheets, it's gummed. It's got gummed edges, so it's glued all the way around, all the way around. So there's a block of, I think, um, 15 sheets, 20 sheets actually in the Fabriano. So these 20 sheets are glued all the way around to form a really rigid block. Okay, so it's like a pad of paper. The only exception to this gummed edge is there's a nice little opening here where you can actually access um, the individual sheets, but it's just one very short portion, like maybe an inch. So what happens is you can kind of paint these uh, sheets are because they're glued and secured you don't have to worry about them warping or buckling and as soon as I'm finished and the painting is 100% dry I can go to that little opening and just pop off the upper piece of paper and the paper underneath hasn't been compromised it's nice and safe under there so I really like the Fabriano block I have to say it's even compared to the Arches block and the Windsor Newton block, it stays gummed uh, and like secure really, really well, even when it gets banged around during um, extensive travel. And the other blocks I find the papers eventually separate and uh, so it kind of defeats the purpose of having a block in the first place. So um, what I do then is I like to have a test strip of paper. So I'm just going to fold this block back and I've got an extra strip of watercolor paper in behind and then just clamp it like that. So now I've got an extra strip of paper to test any um, colors that I want beforehand. Uh, I'm going to use my B pencil so you guys can see the sketch that I'm doing but normally I use a 2H which is much lighter so I'm going to use that pencil. I'm going to have my needed eraser available uh, so I can make some nice light erasing and I'm going to use I have this travel brush which is a sable Kalinsky sable brush I love it I can flip it around to make a full-size brush and it's a number eight um, pointed red sable so uh, or Kalinsky sable so it's uh, quite a nice brush and if I want to do some bigger blockier areas like a wash brush, instead of bringing my square with me, I've just got a big floppy mop brush. And oh, I don't have my fan out here, so I'll probably run into the studio and grab my fan brush as well. But I like using a liner or like a rigger. It's a nice long bristle, so I'll probably be using that for the stems and any kind of spindly graceful lines. And then I use from my, uh, so this one is from my, my line of brushes that you can uh, find them on my website under shop. Um, this is the Ivory Rigger. And then this one is my Ivory Filbert, again, under my label. Um, and it's a, just a really nice stiff brush that I like to use for mixing because I don't want to ever use my sable brushes or any natural hair brushes for mixing. Uh, for a couple of reasons. One, the bristles are too soft and super absorbent. So when you're using natural hair brushes, um, the uh, paint gets soaked up into the bristles and you waste a lot of paint. If you use a nice stiff synthetic brush like this one, you can make much more um, lustrous pools and, uh, and develop the pools a lot more quickly and efficiently because you're grabbing mostly pigment. It's not just soaking up the pigment. You're just sort of grabbing pure pigment and you can deposit it without uh, so much waste. So that's what I'm using. And uh, that honestly, that's about it. I don't use a, a wide range of brushes, even though my kit looks kind of extensive. I just brought everything out. Maybe I'll bring out this, bust out this number three here. Okay, awesome. So. Um, the peonies are just coming into light right now, which is nice. It's more dynamic. I'm going to do like a blow up so that you guys can um, see. So I, while I, I just adore my little 
statue here, I think I'll just do a blow up of um, and try to capture both the sunlit and the shady peonies. So with peonies, the, the blossoms are quite complex. So what I like to do is just kind of uh, lay my pencil down and almost do not necessarily a blind contour drawing because I am checking in with my paper. I am looking down on it, but I like doing um, a contour drawing and then just sort of scribbling in these shapes and keeping my pencil connected to the paper like this makes me feel a little bit more connected to the peony itself. So I am using a B pencil so that hopefully you guys can see my sketch, but the reality is um, I would normally use an 2H pencil because it's much lighter. So here comes the little bud. And I'll be moving things around a little bit just so I can, the, my peonies are um, spaced quite, like quite dramatically. So I'm gonna bring in some flowers to just make sure that everything is kind of connecting properly and feeling like part of the same scene. So I'm just lightly sketching in some leaves here, just trying to get a flow and a feeling for this. Here comes another bloom. This one's a little bit closer to me, but the reality is it's a, a smaller bloom. But to make it feel not disproportionate, I'm actually going to enlarge it to make it feel like it's closer so that we interpret that space a little bit better. And then I've got some distant buds and semi blooms that are in sunlight over here. So I'm going to keep any background kind of supporting characters um, just uh, lighter and a lot more sketchy. The more detailed my sketch, the more inclined I am to be more careful with that area when I'm painting. So when I treat an area just very lightly and kind of in a very sketchy manner, that's a nice reminder for me to loosen up in that area with paint as well. So that's about it. That's all I'm gonna sketch, okay? Um, if I need to lighten anything up, I can use my kneadable eraser and I just turn it into a little snake. And I just roll it over the surface like that. So instead of going around and trying to erase with the same pressure, I just roll it over the surface. That is my little tip for you. So the, my plein air painting experience is always a little bit different than my um, in-studio experience. <coughs> and that is because um, I'm trying to just capture the feeling. It's not like a petal by petal kind of painting. I'm just capturing the um, the complexity of the peony as a flower and um, trying to get all that wonderful texture and light. So normally I start my paintings working from light to dark and all the wet into wet background stuff first and then work my way to the darker, drier details. I am going to put in a little bit of a wet into wet background here, but I'm also going to um, do something kind of strange, which is to start by kind of scribbling in some of the texture on the dry paper. Moving my stuff around here. Right. So I am going to block in some of um, the washy areas very quickly. I'm just going to use a lemon yellow. I guess I'll keep this here. I'm going to use a lemon yellow. And I'm only working on a 9 by 12 surface, so it's really not that difficult to cover a large area. 
Um, if this was a super hot day and I was completely exposed out in the sun, I would probably pre-wet my paper so that it flows a little bit more easily. But um, this is actually pretty cool today and I'm not too concerned with um, the paper drying as quickly. So I like to paint with a Kleenex in my left hand so I can quickly blot. So this lemon yellow is just a nice reminder of how sunny some spots are. And I can always blot out anything that I feel um, shouldn't have had any yellow there. I'm going to use a sap green. It's almost, to be honest, it's more like um, a leaf green. And I'm just going to establish some more natural areas here. Just give a lushness to the foliage. So just blocking in, again, my studio paintings are much more complex and much more uh, developed than this, but this is just for fun and to give you guys an idea of how quickly you can kind of capture um, the look and the feel of a flower bed. So I'm mixing some lemon yellow and some leaf green together. <coughs> I'm just getting some really bright areas here. So as always with watercolor, I always feel like those first few shapes, like you're like, eh, nothing is really happening here. <laughs> and the shapes are um, all kind of blending together, but that's okay. The structure of it comes in later. We build a watercolor through multiple glazes, and certainly when I'm in the studio, it, it goes much, much farther than that. But in the plein air experience, um, it's certainly a lot more spontaneous. Um, but, and the, and the layers are fewer for sure. So I'm just taking some hooker's green dark and some violet and mixing those together so that I have that ready as a shadow tone for later. And I don't seem to, let's see what this is. It's hard, I haven't used this uh, set in, oh, there we go, that's quite nice. I haven't used this set in a while, so I actually don't know where all the colors are. It comes with a chart, of course, but I, I don't have that available to me right now. This is sort of like a hooker's green dark um, combination with a little bit of uh, burnt umber. So what I want to do here is try to capture um, the light and shadow play before it changes too, too much. It's so hard when you're painting plein air because the light keeps shifting and um, it's difficult, I find, to kind of commit yourself to one, um, one decision. It's like, oh, well, this flower went from being in shadow to being in light now. So do I change that or no? <laughs> My suggestion is that you do not change it. Um, you'll just end up with mud when you make changes like that constantly. The watercolor can't handle it. In an oil or acrylic situation, you can paint over very easily, but with watercolor, it can't handle those numerous changes. Um, so you kind of have to decide right from the get-go which flowers you're committing to light and which you're committing to shadow. So that's why I'm trying to establish that now. So I'm going to do the same thing for this bloom that's um, partially in shadow. I'm just taking a violety tone here, which will act as my shadow color. A little bit of ultramarine to lighten it up. So what I'm doing is laying the shadow across now before it changes. 
And I don't mind having some lost and found edges, so having a little bit of color kind of spilling over like that or bleeding into the background edge, that's fine. So again, kind of um, ultramarine and ultramarine being used in the uh, really darker, cooler shadows and then a violet tone being used for the pinkier shadows that are closer to the light. I'm working on dry here and like I said I'm just kind of sketching in my shadowy shapes I like using a pointed round because I can get a mix of shapes I can get a really nice fine tip and get some fine lines if I wanted something finer still I could of course work with a much smaller brush this is like a number eight. I will take a photo of my painting setup for you guys and I'll post it in my stories. You can always take a screenshot. I don't know if you can save it, but you can always take a screenshot of it um, for your future reference. On my website, I have a few blog posts about what my art kit is as well. So you can always visit crystalbeshera.com and then click on my blog uh, and kind of scroll through some of the stories to find what I bring when I go plein air painting. So the flowers in, or the buds that are in the sunlight, um, I'm gonna make them just a little bit peachier and pale, quite pale. So I'm just kind of sketching them in for now. Very, very lightly. I might come back to them after with um, deeper, richer tones, but for now, I hope this is still okay for a view. <clears throat> um, so because I'm in the shade, this actually is gonna take a little while to dry. I really love this granulation that's happening in where the green is creeping into the violet tones in the flower. I think that's really pretty. So again, working much faster than I normally do in the studio environment. So for those of you who saw my Tupperware container, actually I have two here, so maybe I can look that out. So um, when I travel, I mentioned I bring two stackable Tupperware containers and um, I just find it great because they're super lightweight and they have nice stable bottoms. I've tried the collapsible containers, those silicone ones that are kind of telescopic or they're like accordion-like, <laughs> um, but I find the bottoms are too soft and um, they can tip over sometimes. So I like this one because it's got two sections. So what I do is I keep a clean pot of water on one side and then the other side can be for rinsing my brush so it will get dirty. So I always have clean water to draw from. Alternatively, um, if those kind of get muddied up a little bit, what I do then is at least focus on lighter, cooler colors in one and then darker, warmer colors in another and just keep the water um, as separate and uncontaminated as possible. So this is still pretty wet, as you can see, so I can't put any um, contrasting sharp edged lines in there just yet because it will all just bleed together. That's a little bit drier back there. So maybe I'll just start working on some of the leaves. So anything in the background will be pale and soft and sketchy. Anything in the foreground will be richer, more textural and more developed. And that's how we can kind of keep our um, focus. 
and I want background leaves to be smaller in scale and background buds to be smaller in scale as well. All of these little tips kind of keep you um, keep your keep your painting in perspective. So that one is still pretty damp, so I don't want to jump in there just yet. This is where a hairdryer in the studio would be handy. <laughs> Alas. What I'll do in the meantime is just mix up some color. So I'm using, um, again, the St. Petersburg Yarka set. And because I haven't used it too often, I had like one set forever that I loved and it was about half the size. Uh, and I took it everywhere and it just eventually fell apart. So I'm still kind of learning where these colors are. That looks like a permanent rose there, so that's good. And I'd like a really, really bright pink, like an opera rose, but I don't have that out in, like I don't have that kind of equivalent color in this set, so I'll just have to make do. So that's quite dark. That's kind of fun color, actually. Let's see if I can sneak that in. So you can see this is still pretty damp, so the color is spreading. But I can do a little bit of uh, manipulation in here. Woo! This peony, which was completely in shadow, is now completely in light. So <laughs> things have changed. So I'm glad I laid down the shadows first. So that's a really um, helpful tip. If you are absolutely in love with your light and shadow effect when you're in plein air and you sit down and you're like, oh, this is this is perfect. This is exactly what I had hoped for. Or you're trying to capture um, something um, before it shifts. I highly suggest that you get your shadows down first. You can paint over top. It's no problem. Sort of a blurry bloom back here. And you can paint over top when the layer is completely dry. So long as you're not super duper soaking your paper, it's fine. When you're working in glazes like that, uh, the, the paint underneath stays relatively static. So uh, you don't have to worry if you're just working and work like light washes over top in true glaze form, uh, that's totally fine. If you're working with staining colors, then it's even uh, a, it's a much better idea because the paint is even safer. It kind of penetrates the paper, it stains the paper, and if you re-wet after it's dried, it won't budge. So it's not just about picking pretty colors to use. Um, eventually it's important for you to also shift to learning which colors do what, uh, which ones are staining, which ones are transparent, which ones are opaque for their pigment properties, not just for the color. So it's still a little on the damp side. So if I were to put water over top of it now, it will definitely bleed. But that's actually an okay thing for me because I want, I don't want this to look too cartoony. So I am going to um, just lay some lighter tones over top while it is a little bit wet. So you'll see it kind of creates a bit of a bloom in sections, but that's sort of a pretty effect. And this is very like high key lighting right now, big major differences between my lights and my, my dark. So um, 
I don't want to diminish that effect. I'm going to be going back in afterwards and uh, adding the darker values. So until then, I'm going to let this dry. I'm going to place this in the sunlight. Okay, so it's relatively dry. I think it's probably dry enough that we can proceed to the next layers. And again, the light has shifted immensely here. So I'm relying on the uh, light and value patterns that I established earlier. And I'll just keep drawing upon those and deepening the darks and making sure that I keep the lights as light as they are because I really like that light um, play that was on the peonies earlier. It's just part of the trials and tribulations of working plein air. The light shifts really quickly and uh, sometimes it can be confusing, but I think if you try to establish your lights and darks at the beginning as much as possible, uh, that is the key to success. So I'm taking a little bit of ultramarine right now and some hooker's green dark, and I'm just making kind of a turquoisey color. Little bit deeper so I'm going to start painting on the shadows for the stems and some of the leaves so at first you might be like I have no idea what she's doing here <laughs> she has no idea what she's doing but uh, it will come together I promise I promise and ideally I don't know how to do a split screen but Maybe there's some magic to that. Um, if you could see what I'm looking at right now, what I'm doing is just trying to establish the uh, shadow shapes on the leaves and the stems. And then, uh, so these are the positive shadow shapes. And then eventually I will flip to doing some of the negative shapes. So I'll just sketch in some of the veins. And then I have a nice, a really nice dark sepal here. So I want to make sure that the darkest darks are not black, but they are dark enough that they read as being in the deepest parts of the shadow on this plant. So I'm working on a dry surface so my shapes are not bleeding they're staying exactly where I put them because the paper is dry enough. And that's why I put it out in the sun because I wanted to ensure that uh, it wasn't going to bleed at this phase. To get that bold dramatic lighting effect, I need to make sure that the shapes are going to stay put and that they appear really, really sharp. This one has stem and then a few dark leaves. Now the darker I go in the um, foliage and in the dark greens, the brighter the flowers will look. I can't make the flowers any brighter than they are right now at this phase in my painting. All I can do is make the surrounding darks darker. So if I wanna make these uh, flowers seem brighter, that's what I will do. I hope that makes sense. You can't have light without some darkness. And I'm not trying to be, uh, you know, woo woo, like, <laughs> although that is true. Um, it's, it's just a reality, like, you need context to understand the relative shapes or sorry, the relative um, value. So if you don't have context, if you don't have a baseline for your lights and your darks, uh, we won't understand the change in shadow or in sunlight. So it's important to keep those distinctions. So I'm really kind of carving around this peony. This one's, I really have, I just love the way that the, the water 
um, pools and the pinks and violets just bled into the pale yellow background. And that's great for a mid to background flower, but this flower here, I want to bring forward. So I'm going to be uh, making the edges a little crispier. So again, if you're just joining, I'm painting live, live in front of my peony bed. Um, I only have one peony plant, let's, let's be real here. But what I'm doing is um, something that's a lot looser in style than how I normally paint. That's okay. It's good to push ourselves. I'm using the St. Petersburg Yarka watercolor set. Um, I really love how pigmented these colors are. I highly recommend. You can shoot me a message later if, uh, if you need a reminder. The only thing is, like I said, I don't really know this new set because it's, a, it's the ultra set. I'm not familiar with the placement of the colors and the pigments are so pigment, or the paints are so pigmented that um, they're hard to read in the pans when they're dry, so I'm still getting to know it a little bit. Right now what I'm doing is kind of sketching on the darkest darks inside of the plant. And uh, I can drop in some richer colors while those little shapes are still wet. So I'll just drop in like a permanent rose there. I'll go to this side now as well using warmer colors in the sunlight and cooler colors in the shadow. So that goes for my pink selection as well. I can work with sort of hotter pinks, orangier pinks in the sunlight and cooler, more violety pinks in the shadow. So that means these buds that are in sunlight can be a little warmer. If you're interested in this demo, it's just paper, It'd be super easy to ship. So just send me a message and um, we can work it out. I'd be happy to send it to you. I'm using um, some yellows here for the stems. The stems in sunlight, especially on the newer buds are really, really quite warm. A little bit of warmth to this one too. So I'm just gonna pull that through. Oftentimes too, you've got a little bit of red in the stem or pink in the stem, which is such a, oh, I just love that part of peonies. Like the, how the, um, the pink just carries through into the veins and the texture of the, the stem themselves. So now just working on a little bit more finer detail here. I'm not going to take this too much farther. Uh, I like how it's taking shape. It's a little bit of nothing going on back here. So I'm going to add a little bud here, little baby bud over here.
All right, I'm going to bring in, I think the last bit for me is just to bring in a little bit of like real, real dark into this corner here just to kind of anchor things a bit. So that is going to be this um, Hooker's Green Dark color with some violet. Wherever my violet is, I think this is it. Nope, that's Prussian, but that will do actually. I think that's my violet. <laughs> Are you my mother? Here we go, here we go. All right. So now I'm gonna paint um, some negative spaces here. So the negative space painting is really just uh, a matter of looking at the shapes between the leaves and the stems. A lot of people struggle with negative space painting because it's not natural, like you want to paint the object, not the spaces between the objects. So it can be a bit of a challenge, but it's so worth it once you have like that ding ding moment. I don't want to outline my peony, so I have to be careful that I'm not going around creating this dark halo. That won't look very natural, so. And I'm rinsing my brush and just kind of bleeding out some of these areas. So they're not so harsh. I'll make this dark down here. 